Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome both to those of you who are Zooming in from home or office, but also to a group gathered at the for live stream in the Mars building. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Sheila McElraith, and I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, where Marsha Chechik just finished her term as chair, as uh, Canada CIFAR AI chair at the Vector Institute, and also associate director here at the schwartz riesman Institute for Technology and Society. Before we begin today, uh, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. So for thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. These and other Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island developed complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people who are working to reclaim their rights to self-determination and self-governance, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we may all be joining from different places today, we encourage you to reflect on the history and the relations of the land you live and work on. So a few logistics before we begin. I want to remind everyone that this talk is being recorded. Uh, I also wanted to mention that Moshe uh, will speak for about an hour, which is a little bit longer than some of our talks, but discussion will follow, and Moshe has generously agreed to hang out after 4.30. For those of you who, who do have time, I know many will have to leave right at 4.30, so I, I will pause at that time, but but if you can stay on and and we have things to talk about, then, then Moshe has um, said that he'll stay on longer. So uh, with that, um, and, and I'll ask you to raise hands during the discussion period in the Q&A that will we'll follow. So with that, I just want to introduce Moshe. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Moshe Vardy, university professor and Kara Nostrum, uh, uh, George, distinguished service professor of computational engineering at Rice University, where he leads the technology, culture, and society initiative. For those of us in computer science, Moshe needs no introductions. As my students would say, he's the OG. Um, we asked, funnily, we asked Moshe for a brief bio and his long bio is, his, his short bio is so long that he wrote, he, he uh, abbreviated it a level and wrote, he is a recipient of several scientific awards, is a fellow of several societies and a member of several honorary ac academies, which I, I laughed at, uh, true. But uh, that several is a lot by mortal standards. And these awards and the societies of which he is a fellow are among the most prestigious in our discipline. I'm not going to, they are too numerous to list as he found as well. Moshe has a good sense of humor. So he holds eight honorary doctorates and he has authored uh, and co-authored over 700 papers as well as two books. He's incredibly prolific and his contributions to the theory and practice of computer science are profound. Most importantly for young and I guess not so young scholars in the field, he serves as an inspiration, a North, a North Star, if you will, for how to conduct an academic career, reflecting both the privileges and the responsibilities of what for many of us is a calling. Moshe, with that, you're, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this very kind introduction. It's, um, it's remind, remind me of an old folktale about a paper submitted by three PhD students for MIT, from MIT. And the first one has a footnote next to his name, and it says AT&T Fellow because he received a fellowship from the AT&T Foundation. And the next one has footnote Hertz Fellow because he received a fellowship from the Hertz Foundation. And the third one has a footnote, and it's a jolly good fellow. So today, I want to talk to you about how to be an ethical computer scientist. But before I get to the meat of the talk, I want to give like an introduction to the talk. But I'm not flipping pages. Okay. First, I want to acknowledge the huge loss that we just have had of Fahim Bakhus. I mean, I saw the news, I think on the weekend, and I'm, I was just in shock. And I posted it on, on immediately on Facebook. And the comments for people were just really touching. You know, people just saying they both admiration to him as a scientist, as a professional, and as a human being. And so 
I was looking forward when I was invited to give the talk. I was kind of thinking, oh, it would be nice to talk to Fahim. And so I'm dedicating this talk to Fahim Bakus, whom we just lost. And this is a wonderful picture. I can't think of any better picture to capture the essence of Fahim. Now, a few years ago, after the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke out in 2018, on some uh, kind of a website, a white combinator news website, there was a, there's a forum. And here's the quote I copied directly from the forum. F dot 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 ethics and morality. We Facebook are allowed to brag about our page exercise. If this is how you feel, you're probably in the wrong talk. But don't leave because I hope that you will change your mind. Now I must confess the title is a little bit of a, click, of a clickbait. I'm not really going to tell you how to be an ethical computer scientist. This, this is not a manual. It's a conversation. I will discuss what, what, what does ethical means. And I will discuss how to pursue ethics because you really cannot be ethical. You have to pursue ethics. And we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of the famous speech by John F. Kennedy about going to the moon, which he gave at Rice University. And to par paraphrasing John, John F. Kennedy, we pursue ethic, ethics not because it is easy, because it is hard. And if I manage to inspire some reflections in you, then I've accomplished my goal. Now, what it is not, so here is a course that uh, I found that Udemy has a core on human value and professional ethics. And you talk about carrying out official decision and policies and standards of performance and maximizing efficiency and condition for teamwork and maximize and maintain confidentiality. I will not talk about any of that. Professional ethics, I'm not saying it's not important. Professional ethics can be summarized is do a good job. That's not what I'm going to talk about. And here is also, I will go into break tradition. So Max Weber was a, a 19th century, early 20th century German sociologist considered by many to be one of the fathers or the, the parent of, of sociology. And the modern research university was really created in Germany in the 19th century. And Max Weber, one of the, you know, shaping the university, he played an important role. And his attitude was the austere duty of the scholar is to preserve objectivity by distinguishing between facts and values. And by refusing to make in his capacity as a scholar judgment about values. I will not be Weberian here. This talk is going to be personal and political and very opinionated. And another caveat, I'm not a moral philosopher. I'm a concerned computer scientist. I will talk about my perspective as a computer scientist. Now, some years ago, I visited Harvey Mudd, where uh, Maria Clave is the president, and she's an old friend, colleague and friend of mine. And on her wall, there is this sign, don't be a jerk. And it's a bit jarring. You go to president's office, university president's office, and there is a sign, don't be a jerk. So I asked, I asked her to explain it. And she said, I'm the most powerful person in this institution. My decision can have uh, significant consequences for people. People will not always even tell me about what I'm doing. I need a constant reminder not to be a jerk. And if you want, this is not a, a bad basis for ethics. Ethics beginning, don't be a jerk. But I want to go a little, a little deeper than don't be a jerk. And for this, I'll go back to my childhood. I grew up on a kibbutz in Israel, very idyllic place. You can see a picture here. It was a great place to grow up. At about age 10, um, my parents got me 10 volume of the young technologist. And I'm coming from a rabbinical family. And I think my father had some hopes that I would follow in the, in the family tradition. But this book convinced me to go on the scientific path. But my wife always said, you can take the boy out of the synagogue but you cannot take the synagogue, synagogue out of the boy. So please come with me back to the synagogue. 
At age 13, I celebrated my bar mitzvah. And what Jewish boys are supposed to do is they are supposed to read from the Torah. They are supposed to read a portion from the Tentatuk. And what they read depends on the, on the date. It's not, you, don't, you don't choose what to read. It's assigned to you depending on the date that you're doing the reading. And my reading was from a, a, the book of Numbers, chapter 19. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein there is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke, and ye shall give her unto Elazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Elazar the priest shall take off her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin and her flesh, and her and her blood with her dung shall be burned. Shall he burn? Age 13, this did not resonate with did not resonate me at all. Did not resonate, no resonance whatsoever. But other parts of the of the Pentateuch did resonate with me. You shall not treat, you shall not mistreat a stranger, nor shall you oppress him, for you are a stranger in the land of Egypt. One law shall be him on, shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. You shall not oppress any widow, widow or orphan. If you oppress him, if he cries out to me, I shall surely hear his cry. This did resonate with me. So there is a, as you read through the Pentateuch, there is just very different. Just compare this, this thing about burning the dung of the, of the heifer with this text, which I find very uplifting. So the Bible is not a coherent document. And even the Pentateuch, which supposedly the five books that Moses wrote, most likely were written by different people at different periods of time. And a careful reading reveals inherent tension. And one major tension in the Bible, we described by the, the Jewish writer Asher Ginsberg in 1922 in an essay called The Priest and the Prophet. And he said, there's really a fight in, in the Bible between the priests and the prophets. Remember what we just read about the heifer. Here is Amos 5, 22 to 24. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I would not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat beasts. Take thy away from me the noise of thy song, for I will not hear the melody of thy viols, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Now, if you kind of think of the Bible chronologically, you think that first there was Moses and the five books and the priests came hundreds of years later. I'm sorry, the prophets came hundreds of years later after the priest. But the reality is that we don't know exactly when the Bible was born, was, was written down, but it happens usually during the first temple period, estimates vary between the sixth and 10th century BCE. So the, the, the tension was not over the years, but at the same time, there was tension between the priests and the prophets. But this, reveal, this reflects even a deeper tension that they go to the very roots of Judaism, which is mo morals, versus rituals. The, the red heifer is about, is about rituals. Amos is about morals. But if you go back to the focus on morals, it was not invented by the Jews. If you really go back, the first written source that we have goes back a thousand years earlier, goes to Hammurabi's Code, which is a Babylonian legal text composed around 18th century BCE. And here is the prologue of Hammurabi's Code. Anu and Bel, these are Babylonian gods, called by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who fear God, to bring about the rules of righteousness to the, in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evil doers, so the strong should not harm the weak, to further the well-being of mankind. This focus on morality for the well-being of mankind is almost 4,000 year old, 4,000 year olds, and I said, there may be other cultures that have this, but at least the one source that written down is from Mesopotamia. So what is what does it mean to be ethical? 
we go back to, to, to Amos. The judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And one way I read this is first of all, stand up for the weak. And I want to tell you a few instances where I stood up for the weak as much to the best of my ability. And I'm telling you this, 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 this uh, incidents, these stories, not to brag, but to inspire you, I hope, and further to inspire myself to do more of this. And the first standing up for the week goes back to uh, early 90s when I'm a computer scientist at IBM, IBM Almaden. 1989, I became a department manager. Ashok Chandra became two years later as director of, of computer science. And Thomas Feder was hired the same year as a research staff member. And the tradition was after one year, you give a talk to all the second line manager, all department managers, and that's considered your first year review. And you talk about concern satisfaction. Uh, Ashok did not like the talk. And after the talk, he called me and he said, you have to tell Thomas that he failed the review. I thought this was fantastic work. And I said, I'm sorry, Ashok. I'm afraid I cannot do that. I think this is good work. There's no way I can tell him he failed the review. Ashok was smart enough to know not to go to a fight over this. So he said, well, you're his manager. It's your responsibility to manage him. Eventually I left IBM and Thomas left IBM. In 2018, this work received the church award. Unfortunately, Ashok Chandra passed uh, young at uh, 2014 for um, uh, liver cancer. So this incident is number one. Now I'm at Rice University and across the street from Rice, there is a medical school, Baylor College of Medicine. And they made some huge investment in real estate and they found themselves overextended just when the financial crisis blows up. And they look across the street and they see a rich small private university and they wanted Rice to bail them out. It's a new meaning for the word bailor, right? They wanted Rice to be the bailor. Now, if you understand, Baylor is three times bigger than Rice in budget, in faculty member, by any criteria. They're much bigger than us. The president at the time, David Lebron, he just stepped down on July 1 of this year. He liked the idea because it will make him president of a much bigger university. In November of 2008, I was asked by Lebron to join a faculty advisory committee. I said, well, this is such an important move. The president asked for advice, surely, I should accept to be on the committee. But after a few meetings, it became clear that this committee, the purpose of this committee was what we call the theater of consultation. To pretend that he's consulting with the faculty, his mind was made up. And there was a lot of political maneuvering and eventually the faculty senate appointed a faculty merger review committee. So a committee that was just purely a faculty committee he would write a report, but he was not responsible to the president. He did not report to the president. So the president appointed his own committee of administrators. And 2009 was the battle of the committees. The faculty manager review committee issued a negative report. They thought it was risky and the upside was, was limited. Lebron's committee issued a glowing positive report. The dispute became very public opposing op-eds in the right fresher, the Houston newspaper, opposing op-ed in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, in October of that year, I gave a public lecture. You can find it on YouTube. The whole may be less than the sum of the parts, not some of the parts, I'm sorry, sum, S-U-M of the parts. In January of 2010, the negotiations were terminated by Rice. Many, many people thought that I managed to, sabotage, to, to somehow uh, sabotage it but I don't deserve that credit. My opinion, my role was to shine a bright light on a bad deal and speak truth to power. And everything, all the story in, in all the detail is available on my, on my homepage. So to me, this is part of the responsibility of standing up for the weak. But now I want to talk to be how ethical computer scientists, what specific computer science, what I told you before is not specific to computer science. So 
I'm very involved with ACM. And ACM over the past decade, there's three major events. 2012 was the Turing Centenary. And it was all celebration of computing as an ascendant technology. It was a cent the centenary of Turing's birth. 2017, five years later, the Turing world is 50 years old, another celebration of computing. In June of this year, June 10 of this year, ACM is 75, celebrating ACM 75 birthday. Now the tone was much more sober and somber. The panelists will imagine what might be next for technology and society in years to come. Suddenly we're talking about technology and society. One of the participants wrote on Facebook, I found the whole thing a little depressing. But you cannot talk about at 75 and disconnect it from what happened just before that. A day before the at 75, the House of Representatives started its first public hearing in the United States about January 6, in January 6, 2021 insurrection, where we learned essentially that the, the President of the United States essentially tried to mount a coup against the, 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 the legal transfer of power. And two weeks before that, where the massacre in Uvalde, Texas, where 19 children and two teachers were killed by a gunman. And I took it very personally, not because it was only in Texas, because every time I heard on the radio Uvalde, I could hear it, Uvalde, Uvalde. So I, I was very shaken by that. So, so what, what is happening in this country? Well, it turned out that right now, the United States is deeply polarized. Take these two issues of January 6 and, and, the, and the Uvalde massacre. So New York Times poll from July of this year about Trump. 92% of Democrats think that he threatened US democracy. While 76% of Republicans think he was exercising his rights to contest the election. Gun ownership about this AR-15 style semi-automatic rifles. Some people call them assault rifles. Among gun owners, NP NP NPR survey from June, Democratic gun owners, 85% believe in banning sales of assault weapons. Among Republican gun owners, 75% object to any restriction on, on the sale of, gun, of, of assault weapons. When you have a country so deeply polarized, you get political paralysis and democracy in danger because democracy requires some level of trust. In December of 2021, George Schultz, who used to be the Secretary of State of the United States, he died about a month later at age 100. He wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. And he wrote, when trust was in the room, good things happen. When trust was not in the room, good things did not happen. Everything else is in detail. If you have depolarization, you don't have trust and democracy cannot function. So right now, there are serious discussion whether democracy in the United States is viable. People talking about, will the United States break into two confederations of the red and the blue states? And people are discussing it as a serious possibility. This, this is an article just from this last issue of the New York Review of Books. Um, if Robert Kagan in the Washington Post wrote last September, the United States, is heading into its greatest political and constitutional crisis in the civil war, with an real chance over the next three to four years of incident of mass violence, a breakdown of federal authority, and the division of the country into warring red and blue enclaves. Um, uh, in the Hill, the Hill is a Washington, Washington DC publication. Brad Dress, a majority of Americans said the US government is corrupt. Almost a, th a third said it soon might be necessary to take up arms against it, according to a new poll from the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. So clearly something happened in this country, and the question is what went wrong? And I have no doubt that historians will spend the next 50 years trying to figure out what happened to the United States of America. But I will try to offer, you know, I don't have 50 years to do it. I think we need some answers now. 
And I'll offer my own answer. And this will go back to 1981. So what happened in 1981, 40, 41 years ago? The first epochal event in September 6th of 1981, I arrived as a young postdoc at Stanford, California. But more significantly, about a month before that, IBM introduces the IBM Personal Computer Model 5150 known as the IBM PC. And equally significantly, at the beginning of the year, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as US president. So let's look at the last two events, the PC and Ronald Reagan. The PC changed computers from, before that there were hobbyist tools. There were personal computer going back to the mid seventies, but suddenly it became a business machine, IBM business machine. Time Magazine has every January an issue, the person of the year. And now Time Magazine has in January 8, 1983, the, the machine of the year, the computers move in and, and machine went, personal computers went mainstream. By the middle of the decade, every knowledge worker has a computer on their desk. By the late eighties, every knowledge worker has a computer at home. Late eighties, 1989, the World of Web was introduced. Mid nineties, the internet was commercial. Google launched by late, by 1998. Facebook launched 2004. iPhone introduced 2007, a tsunami of technology. But equally significantly, this all happened when we also have a tsunami of neoliberalism, which Reagan introduced in the United States and Margaret Thatcher started in 79 in the UK. And neoliberalism is free market capitalism on steroids. It usually means economic liberalization, less affair, a reduction in government spending, privatization, deregulation, monetarism, tax reduction, globalization, free trade, and so on and so forth. In 2006, the billionaire Warren Buffett, not exactly as a, a known as a, as, a, as a bleeding heart socialist, said in an interview, there's a class war, class war for all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war, and we are winning. So what was the outcome of these two trends together, tsunami of technology and tsunami of neoliberalism? So we hear a lot about the decline of manufacturing in the United States. People think it's because of globalization. But if you look at volume of manufacturing, and that's the red line in real dollars, adjusted for inflation, you see it, of course, it zigs and zags a little bit, but generally it's been going up and up all these years. What has collapsed, peaking around 1980, is manufacturing employment. And we have lost many millions of jobs in manufacturing employment, which had huge adverse impacts on the working class in the United States. And in fact, what you see here is a point of inflection around 1983. If you look from 53 to 83 for 30 years, you take four economic indicators, labor productivity, private employment, median household income, and real GDP, and they kind of go together. As, we, as the economy becomes more productive, GDP, GDP rises, employment rises, income rises. But sometimes in the, mid, in, the, in, in the early 80s, we see that productivity continues to grow and GDP continues to grow, but we're creating fewer jobs and income has flattened. So now we have a growing polarization. So if you compare here what happened in 75, to 2018, this is a run corporation study. The bottom 90% had say 67% of the income in 1975. But by the time they go to 2018, they, they lost ground, they're at 50%. The 10th the percentile, the top 10%, 10, per, uh, the top one, uh, 10, 10 increased their share a little bit, but the top 1%, make like bandits, they went from 9% to 22%. But it is easy to think this is just all about the one percenters. It's not. Look at what happened the economy across the skill spectrum. So economists divide the labor, the labor market by low skill and middle skill and, and high skill. So in 1983, you see we have 15% of low skill and 26% 20, of high skill and 59% of middle skill, that's the middle class. And you go to 2018, low skill, 
slight increase, high skill, a significant increase, middle skill, significant decline. So the middle class is shrinking. The working class is holding place, but high skill, high skill is us. So now we're not talking about the one percenter. Very few people that are, are knowing computer science are, high, are in the in the in the one percent, but we are all in the high skill slice of the market. And let's le let's let's look in fact the impact of education on income. And again, this goes from early '60s till 2017. If you look at people with graduate education, they did very well. So their, their, their real income has increased significantly. If you have college education, also your income has kept, play, has kept ground and even increased a little bit. But if you have less in college education, you probably have your income is set flat or gone down. So in our world, we are probably almost all of us here. And if you're undergraduate students, many of them will be there. And they are in the, in the rising, rising wave of income while everybody else is losing ground. David Brooks, who is a conservative columnist for New York Times, wrote last July, I was wrong about capitalism. And he wrote, the most educated Americans were amassing more and more wealth, dominated the best living areas, put pouring advantage into their kids, a highly equal case system was forming. And we don't think of ourselves as, the, as a high case, but we are the high case, high caste. Now, another thing that happened under Reagan was deregulation. And one thing that happened under deregulation was abolishing the fairness doctrine. What was the fairness doctrine? The fairness doctrine required holder of broadcast license, the government owns the spectrum, and it licenses it to, to users, like such as, as TV broadcasters, and that there were there are terms of, of, the, of renting the spectrum. And the, and the requirement was that, that uh, TV uh, channels, uh, networks had to present controversial, controversial issues of public importance and do so in a balanced manner. They have to show all different point of views. 1987, the FCC said, you know, we have cable TV. We don't need any more. We have lots of different uh, channels. They, they, they reflect different point of view. We don't have to tell ABC and CBS and NBC, you must be balanced. And the outcome from this was a community filter bubble. I mean, I've heard from, from some friends and they say something like, oh, my, my father fell into Fox News and I cannot talk politics with him anymore. And if you just watch, if you watch it and there are many places you go, go to, um, Go to many offices, doctor's offices even. They think the clientele is all, Fox News is playing, and it's like a alternative reality though. Now let's go back to the internet. You have to understand, we don't think of cable TV as somehow something that we did. But if you look at computer and communication technology, cable TV is something that computer scientists and engineers have enabled, okay? This is part of, of computing and communication technology called ICT, information, and communication technology. Now let's go back to really computer science. So the, the, the roots of the kind of social media culture of today go back to the 1980s. I was at Stanford, a postdoc. There was something called the Well, it was, was a dial-up bulletin board. There was something called Usenet, Unix to Unix network. Um, but the the the, the the culture of the time was the 60s. When we talk about the 60s in the United States, we're really talking about the 70s. And this was the time of the hippies, and it was very anti-establishment. And out of this, out of this era came the mantra: information wants to be free. Well, information not just beats; it doesn't have it doesn't have wants or desires. But somehow we brought it. Information wants to be free. So when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989, the idea was unfettered public sharing of information. Information should be free. No one questioned it. We all bought it. Now, in the early days, it was exhilarating. Suddenly, you can find so much information at your fingertips. But then we realized, wait a minute, there's so much information. I can't find anything. I mean, it's like you walk into a library with millions of volumes. How do you find anything? 
So the first answer was libraries have catalog. Let's have a catalog for the internet. And that was the whole business model of Yahoo, a catalog for the internet. It was okay in the early years, in the early 90s, but of course it didn't scale. I mean, people put more and more information on the, on the web. It didn't scale. We need the search engines. The early ones were not very good, but then Google came up with a fantastic search engine and poof, it became Google. But Google had to monetize it. How do you make money if information is free? So Google came up with a brilliant business solution, advertising. Newspapers are usually, you don't pay the real price of newspaper. Advertising subsidizes newspapers. Advertising subsidizes broadcast TV. So let's do advertising. They quickly discovered that the effect of online advertising is very low. Why? On TV, well, you're sitting there watching. Okay, you can go to the bathroom. How often can you go to the bathroom? Newspaper, you can, you know, they have to put big, you can flip the page, so they put big advertisement. And they can look for the classified, they put big advertisement. People try to put big, big banners on web pages. Users hated it. So Google came up with another brilliant idea. Micro-targeted advertising. We will match the ad. Each user will see ads that match his or her individual preferences. That require personal data. So when people talk today about machine learning, it's already being used extensively in, in targeted advertising. The killer app today of, of, of machine learning is targeted advertising. You hear a lot about machine learning, what to use. People ignore the, the, the most prevalent use of machine learning, targeted advertising. And the outcome was what we call filter bubble. You see what Google think you want to see. And, and you, Google has to collect a tremendous amount of data about you. And in 2019, Shoshana Zubo from Harvard Business School published The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, where essential phrase is, if, if, uh, if you're not paying for it, somebody has to pay, you're the product. The business model of Google is selling information about you to the advertisers. If you don't want to read 700 pages, Shoshana, Shoshana Zubov, you can go read a short, a short essay that she wrote in New York Times in January 21. Just after the, the insurrection, she wrote, we can have democracy, we can have the surveillance society, but we cannot have both. And the reason is Google knows all about us and we know very little about them. What happened to our data? Who gets it? Where does it flow? Who sells it to whom? We know nothing. So this imbalance of power subverts democracy. And I want to talk about the hypocrisy of Silicon Valley about the, when it comes to privacy. Here is a, a quote. If you have something you don't want to, anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. This is Eric Schmidt, who was in 2000 CEO of Google. But Eric Schmidt in 2005 was upset because some reporters use Google to find out lots of personal information about Eric Schmidt and they publish it to show what Google can reveal. And he was so upset that for a year, Google, the rule in Google was you don't talk to CNET. CNET is a tech, uh, tech publication. So Google boycotted CNET for a year because Eric Schmidt was offended that his privacy was violated. So privacy is good for me, but you don't need it. And then the age of privacy is, is over. Who said it? CEO. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, 2010. But then somebody buys a house in Palo Alto and decided to buy all the houses around it for privacy's sake, Mark Zuckerberg. So all this talk about privacy is not important, it's justifying the business model. It has, has no moral reasoning whatsoever. It just, I want to make money, let's not values and ethics get in the way. And in face, Facebook is took, took the ideas from, from uh, Google, but it's not just about showing you advertisement, it's by showing you content. The content that you see is the content that Facebook wants you to see. So you'll stay, they call it maximum user, user engagement. The more time you spend on Google, the more likely you are to respond to advertisement. So now we need not micro-targeting, micro -tar nano-targeting, 
So Google has incredibly, uh, Facebook has incredibly detailed profile of you so they can show you the content they think you want to see. And if you feel, and especially when you, today we talk about, uh, there's a talk about the, the teenage mental crisis. And when you talk to young people, they are addicted to these social media. And the reason they are addicted, it's by design. It's not an accident. It's not that, that Facebook tried to design something and somehow it came up addictive. It was meant to be addictive. All this, every time somebody gives you a like, you get a little bit of social approval and we all crave social approval. And that's how this app become addictive. In April, April of this year, Jonathan Haidt wrote in The Atlantic, the story of Babel is the best metaphor I have found for what happened to America in the 2010s and for the fractured country we now inhabit. Something went terribly wrong, very suddenly. We are disoriented, unable to speak the same language, recognize the same truth. We are cut off from each other and from the past. And he blames social media. So how are we going to be ethical computer scientists? First, we should accept responsibility. We did this. We can say Facebook did it. The people who work at Facebook, they're my, my students. They're your students. We did it. And I now feel like Enders. So there's a novel, science fiction novel from the mid eighties. And this is spoiler alert. And Ender is a teenage boy. He and his friends, they think they're playing video games. What they don't realize is they are really fighting an intergalactic war. And when they, when they win the video game, they really have, they have destroyed a real planet and a real civilization. So we have this image of ourselves. If to use the Star Wars metaphors, we are the rebel alliance. We are the startup in the garage. I have news for you. We are now the, we are now the empire. We are the Death Star. Now there's a lot of talk about machine ethics and responsible AI and corporate social responsibility. I got on the ethics, I started thinking about ethics because in 2018, I was invited to give a talk at the University of Toronto at the Center for Ethics. And the talk that I said was, was ethics skeptic. I said machines and corporation should be governed by laws and regulations, not by ethics. But people, when it comes to people, that's where ethics is relevant. That's what I'm talking today, not ethics for machines, not ethics for corporations, but ethics for you and me. That's where ethics should come into business. So how should you be, how should we be ethical computer scientists? Let's go to the ASM code of ethics. And I think the first sentence in some sense say, says it all. Computing professionals actions change the world. To act responsibly, they should reflect upon the wider impact of the world, consistently supporting the public good. Remember Hammurabi? For the, for, the, for the benefit of mankind? This was the public good. Hammurabi already told us, the public good. So how to be an ethical, ethical computer scientist? Constantly support the public good. Now, it's interesting when, when uh, I, 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 I taught a class in ethics here at, uh, at Computer Science Student at Rice, and at some point we have a poll among the students whether they'll accept a job offer, a good job offer from Facebook. And about a third of the class said no. It was interesting. And I asked one of them to say, a two thirds said yes. I asked one of the, if someone from the yes, yay, to say why, he said, interesting problems, smart people, good money. I asked one of the, of the, of the no voter to say why. He said, My, I'm a rice graduate. I will be a rice graduate in a year. My skill will be in high demand. I'll have many job offers. Why should I take the one that is ethically questionable. So you have, you're very lucky. You'll have many choices once you graduate. You can, you can afford to be picky. But it also means that you need to think what kind of research you do. So here is a news article. This is from now almost 17 years ago. And it was a news article in Siam News. 
And it's all about an area of research called computational advertising, how to optimize computational advertising. And recently, for computer science, give us an algorithm for optimally ranking advertisements. I don't want to embarrass them, so I didn't put their name. These are all very well-known computer scientists. But let me tell you, working on Google advertising, this does not support the public good. That's how partly Google advertising, how partly how we get this, this, this bubble, you know, filter bubbles. You can do, you can run a, a, a Google a query, what is Exxon, and you'll see some advertisement. What you'll see depends on what Google think of you. If they think that you are bleeding heart liberal, to show you nice clouds, and they talk about CO2 capture. But if they think you're conservative, you're going to see something against regulation. And it's a regulation slow our economy down. That's partly how we, got, we get polarized. We're seeing different realities. Now, of course, supporting the public good is not black and white. Nothing is black and white. We have the, the sixth command is thou shall not kill, kill. You think this is black and white? Of course not. I mean, there is a murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, uh, manslaughter, um, uh, self-defense. You know, we have a, a clear moral edict that shall not kill. And there is a lot to study and we make some exceptions, just war, etc., etc. Et but in some cases, I would say it's very close to being black and white, like working for Uber. So. In, in 2010, Jacobin magazine wrote, from the start, Uber's business model has been based on habitual criminality and a shocking indifference to human life. But Jacobin is a very left-wing publication, so you can dismiss it. But in July of this year, a whistleblower of Uber leaked over 100,000 files to Guardian. And Guardian came up with a serious deep analysis, or book laws, duped pol pol police and secretly lobby governments leak reveals. So Jacobin was right in this case. Ubel was a very corrupt uh, organization. Part is a reaction, reaction to that. I want to use the, the slogan, don't be driven by technology, drive it. I, I stole it from, I'm quoting here, BMW. BMW always had their advertisement was the ultimate driving machine. But now there is auto, autonomous vehicles are auto tot going to be just around, around the corner. So they're trying to say, don't be driven by technology, drive it. I think this is a good slogan for us, for a society today. We should not be driven by technology. We should drive it. In 2019, together with, uh, with other colleagues, we, we published the Vienna Manifesto on Digital Humanism. This is just a, a, a short quote. We must shape technology in accordance with human values and seeds and needs, sort of allowing technology to shape humans. Our task is not only to rein in the downside of information and communication technologies, but to encourage human-centered innovation. And I encourage you to read the manifesto and there is initiative. If you just Google it or web search it, Digital Humanism Initiative, you'll find lots of interesting activities. Now I want to talk a little bit about our role as educators. If we educate students who are not socially responsible, we're not supporting the public good. So it is our social responsibility to educate social responsibility students. I think every CS student today should come out of their program being taught about social responsibility. They have to decide what to do with it. We can, we can force it on them, but they have to be taught what does it mean to be socially responsible. And I would encourage people to, to look at the article that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Deep Tech Ethics, published in 16, 2021. And actually it is, it is very satisfying to teach at a class because the students really sometimes react, most of the students react very, very positively. Here's a quote from a student essay. I believed there was no problem that could not be solved by the, by the all powerful technology. It was only a matter of time before scientists devised the correct algorithm to solve all of the problems of the world. Looking back, I realized how naive I was. I want every computer science student to think this way. Now, I want to go back to the synagogue as I'm ramping up towards the end. These questions of how to be an ethical person was, it's not a new question. 
There is a whole book. The Mishnah is a post-biblical Jewish literature. And there's a whole book we're saying of our father. They deal with this question, how to be ethical person. He held the elder. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm in the plane and the, and the air, air, air pressure drops, I put the question mask first on myself. But being only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when, then, if I, don't, if I don't start now to worry about other people, when will I do that? Rabbi Tarfon talks about the public good. The day is short and the work is plentiful. It's not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect it. None of us can repair the world, but we're not at liberty to neglect the need to repair the world. And even if you go back and you look at the ACM Code of Ethics, the key observation there is to act responsibly, computer professionals should reflect on the wider impact of their work. Again, there is a story in from, uh, there is a story in the Mishnah about Alexander the Great. After he conquers the Middle East, he meets with the Jew, Jewish sages of the South. And you ask them, who is called the wise man? And they responded to him, the person who sees the consequences of his action. I think computer scientists must acknowledge we were not wise. We developed technology and we did not see, we did not think, we don't foresee the consequences of our action of this technology. We've discovered it, oh my goodness, what have we done? We need to think about it before we start. And perhaps it's time for us, you know, doctors have the, 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 an oath. Maybe computer scientists should take an oath, which is called maybe the Lovelacian oath. First, do no harm. And I mentioned Ada Lovelace because she actually wrote a letter to Charles, Bab Charles Babbage saying, I don't object to, Charles Babbage wanted to make money. He wants to start a company and make money. And she wrote, I'm not, I'm not against making money, but we have to think about the public good. She, as far as I know, in computing, she's the first one that raised this issue. And therefore, I, that's why I like to call it the Lovelacian Oath. First, make no harm, do no harm. I want to finish with a little bit of self-promotion. In December of this year, December 5-6, Rice University, we're going to have a two-day conference on technology, culture, and society. We're going to look very broadly at the interplay of technology, culture, and society, information technology, and uh, climate change, and uh, healthcare. And if you're interested in the topic, uh, feel free to write to me or just Google it, you'll find it. Or if not, write to me, and I'm happy, I'll happy to give you a pointer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moshe. That was a wonderful talk. We're now going to transition to the question period. And if people can please use the raise hands um, feature on Google uh, or on Zoom, we'll, we'll take questions. I see that Marsha raised her hand. OK, yeah. Marsha, yeah, you're thank first. You so much. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, I guess my question to you is that of unintended consequences. I am presuming that when a lot of technology was developed, it was not developed to do harm. And in fact, I don't think people were able to foresee that harm. So, I mean, yes, I understand now we're wiser and now I am sure we can, um, we can make a list of harm that we understand now and not do that. What do we do for the unintended harm? How do we proceed with So look, I mean, the reality is there are always unintended consequences. That's what I call unintended, okay? Unintended. If, we, if we, but there are also un, not only unintended, the important thing, they were also unforeseen. But partly I said they were unforeseen because we didn't spend a lot or a lot of time thinking about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not different. You know, I, I look at myself for the last 40 years. How much discussion did we have about what are the possible consequences of technology? I would say we are blind to this, okay? Like we had the attitude, information is good. Therefore, more information is better. And most information is best. And most test information is, is best test, okay? Well, the reality is that there is a limit to how much information we can absorb. So what happened when we were flooded with information? We only take information that we feel 
you know, we start picking and choosing Info, and information that, that, you know, what is called confirmation bias, information that confirms our biases, it's easier to absorb than information that goes against our biases. And did we talk to a psychologist? Did we talk to a sociologist about this? No, no, we were celebrating our success. You know, look at that, look at us, we're so smart, we changed the world. I, it just, you know, the lesson is some humility and uh, to think about, you know, new technology, I think this is something to do with students, to say, okay, let's imagine some, some new technology and what can it do? I mean, one of the things we do with students is now, we watch Black Mirror episodes. And the funny thing is that Wild Magazine, very techy magazine, had, a, had a, a negative review of the new season a, a, a year or so ago, new season of Black Mirror. And what was the complaint? He said, Black Mirror used to be dystopian. Now it's like a reality show. So we, 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 we don't have the practice of thinking about consequences. And I think we need, we need to start developing this price. I don't have a formula, how do we do that? We engage, you know, we do scenarios, we do maybe one team, red team, you know, one team develop, present a technology. The other team job is to find what can go wrong, okay? I mean, what happens with military planning? That's exactly what they do. One team makes the plan, another plan try to find, okay, what can go wrong? Because we all, once we set our mind to do something, we only see the positive. So people have white hackers, okay? Because we need people who will think very hard just how to break the system, because the developer will never see these things. We don't have this, it's not part of how we do business. We need to change. Right, in assurance, which is which is uh, one of the areas where you know I now am, um, there is an explicit uh, methodology of finding defeaters, but to a certain degree, these defeaters are what can go wrong now or soon. But right. forecasting into the future, I don't know if we're capable of as as. You know how about how about that? you know imagine imagine that uh, when uh, Facebook was designing Facebook, imagine that they would have hired some science fiction writers. Because I don't know that we have enough imagination. I'm not sure that I have enough imagination to think of all these things. But bring some science fiction right and say, we're about to develop this technology. Tell us, do, write some scenarios of what can go wrong. And let's discuss how realistic they are. Clearly, clearly what, we, what we have been doing is not working. And so part of the conversation that we need to have is, okay, how to change? And that's why I say it's a call for conversation. We need to brainstorm how to change our basic mode of operation. Okay, uh, I right. see I see Anita is raising her I think, hand. I think Torin, uh, Moshe, maybe we'll go by the order in the participant order. Okay, list Torin. and Yes, Hassan, I see Torin, and okay. And then Mohammed. Yeah. yeah, Torin, please. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. So some of the large tech companies have their own internal ethics groups like Google's AI ethics group, which famously has hired some of its most prominent members. And meanwhile, in academia, a lot of people simultaneously have positions in industry. So it seems that even for the computer scientists who are writing papers on ethics, there's potentially a lot of influence on them from the preferences of the tech companies. So my question is whether you think that um, as a field, we have sufficient safeguards to deal with potential conflicts of interest in these sorts of cases. So my answer is very clear, no, we don't. And uh, okay, this is the, I'm going beyond the talk now. Unfortunately, I think that we, and as I mean, is the whole computing community, including the academics, we all bought into this kind of new liberal computing project. Technology is great. Let's develop it. Let's deploy it. And uh, you know, I mean, I, I have to say, I'm still struggling. Can I tell? Should I tell my students? In, is, it is unethical to work, to work for, for Facebook. I'm still struggling with it because still at the end of the day, now I think I want to tell them about the, the pros and the cons and I want to tell them making decisions. But I'm more and more thinking, you know, about are the people working in this company? They have choices. They can work for, they can do work for something else, okay? It's a well-paying job. Remember, we Facebooker brag about paychecks. It's a, it's a well-paying job. There are interesting jobs. You have lots of smart people around you. Uh, 
sometimes they have they have they do what's called virtual signaling they get upset about contracts of google with the dod and i think this is what you're upset about you have a whole company that is quite, his business model is ethically questionable and you are worried about contracts with the national defense and i still as, a, as far as i know in this world you know any country that become a pacifist did not survive for a long time now we could debate what you do for for national defense okay what kind of contract but to say oh it's a bad thing to to do a contract with dod um i think you know even like acm acm really doesn't know how to deal with it it's okay to deal with with a with a with ethics when you talk about sexual harassment or plagiarism but if you look at people who receive two awards in the last few years you have people who are not just workers in these companies but who are very very high up okay take a look at the take a look at the uh, what is it chief ai officer of meta okay take a look at uh, who was a uh, uh, chairman of the board of uh, of uh, of alphabet these are distinguished people. What do we do about this one? I think we have some very hard questions that we need to answer. Now that we've discovered that we are the we are the empire and not not the the rebels, do we hold ourselves accountable? What does that mean? I think there are some very difficult conversation ahead of us if if we take ethics seriously. Thank you. Moshe, I want to Dina. thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I wanted I wanted to ask. I agree with you uh, on on your analysis, but as a professor of public policy and global affairs, as well as a business school professor, I my experience is that identifying the public good and understanding the public good is quite a complex problem. Uh, and uh, I, I agree with you that deliberation about it is essential. But I think it's it's quite complicated to try to identify what the public good is and what service in the public good is. And just to give a brief, very brief example, we've been working on this paper on the um, implementation of an electronic medical record system in the country of Malawi in uh, AIDS clinics, HIV clinics, and we're finding that that contact tracing of patients that had expressed a desire for privacy that is not to be contact traced generates the greatest benefit in terms of averted deaths. So which principle should dominate the prevention of death or the protection of privacy? That's the kind of problem you get into when you start to think about what the public good is. Would you mind telling me how you think about that, please? Look, in what is the, the, the founding document of the United States? It talks about the public good. It uses a different phrase. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union. Okay? Now, do we agree what is a more perfect union? Of course not. These are difficult things. Okay? We've been we are debating now, since the Constitution was written, we're still debating what is a more perfect union. And we reach agreement on some things which compromises on other things, it's inevitably become political. So that's what I said, it's not gonna be black and white, okay? But at least let's agree on the high level goal, that ethical thing, ethical thing is to support the public good. And now we can debate, and you know, we have the constitution, have amendments. What happens when they conflict with each other? And these are difficult questions, we go to the Supreme Court, and do they reach agreement? Do they, do they have agreement how to read the constitution? No, I'm not saying it's going to be, it's going to be easy. I, I warned you at the beginning, it's going to be hard. But, but uh, you know, I mean, I think that what, what uh, this uh, polarization is caused partly by, by the business model of targeted advertising of Google and Facebook. And there are other effects, for example, a, a newspaper in the United States are gradually being eroded because all advertising revenue goes to Google and Facebook. So I welcome someone to come and talk to me and present a, a passionate case about the benefits of the Facebook model. And then we can debate, you know, as, as you know, I mean, this is really public policy is all about, public policy is all about the public good. That's why you call it public policy. And you guys have to deal with consequences and unintended consequences and trade-offs, all of these things. I have, we computer scientists, 
don't have a lot of expertise. You do it for a living and you know that this is hard. But when you do engage now in a mutual conversation, okay, when we say, for example, what I wrote about, about social media, and the answer is, I don't have a magic solution. I call it the social trilemma. Not dilemma, the social trilemma. What is the social trilemma? We don't want Facebook to decide what can be said. Facebook is, I mean, Facebook is now is the essentially become a public forum. We don't want Facebook to decide what can be said. We don't want the government to decide what can be said. But if, if you do no moderation and no, no, no control, then we know that all kind of horrible content pops in that we don't want to see them, to see there. So how do we, you know, we've given suddenly everybody a megaphone. And now we are surprised that it's noisy when everybody talks on a megaphone and how we're going to control it. So this is a difficult problem. I don't have a magical solution. But my answer is, let's agree on the principle. The Constitution declared its most important principle, in my opinion, in the first sentence, a more perfect union. Now let's, talk, let's let, the, let the debate, the debate uh, ensue. Thank you. Mohammed. Uh, my name is Srifat. I'm a computer science PhD student at UFT. Um, thanks so much for the inspiring talk. Um, I guess I'll take some of your suggestions in my personal life. So thank you for that. Um, so my question is about the differences um, in ethics. You know, there are, um, you're talking about public good and there are many kinds of public um, from Michael Warner and Charles Haskins we have known about the different types of publics and counter publics. Um, the definition of good and bad is different across the world um, in different communities. And so you started your talk with this um, you know, wonderful um, suggestion that, you know, stop being jerk is the first step of being um, ethical. And now let's say that we have passed that um, phase. Uh, we have stopped being jerk. Now uh, the real question comes that whose ethics uh, we're going to be prioritizing when we design technologies, when we you know, intervene, um, make an intervention of technologies around the world. I come from a global South background. And so I know these are uh, really important questions to ask. Um, this, uh, you know, pluralism of um, ethics and, and, and um, uh, politics. And how do we, uh, you know, balance um, different tensions uh, when it comes to ethical pluralism? Remember, I said at the very beginning, we don't pursue ethics because it is easy, because it is hard. And now all these thorny questions, we know that ethical standards People have done even experiments on the trolley problem. And it's in a different part of the world, people behave differently. So we don't have uni universal rules of what people consider ethical. It's culturally dependent. Uh, there are many, many factors, okay? But the point is, let's imagine that an engineering team at, at Google, let's say, is really discussing ethics honestly. I think much of what, when, in my opinion, what, when, when right now Google, and Facebook talk about ethics. I call it ethics washing. It's a theater. Remember, I talk about the theater of consultation that happened at Rice in a university. It's the theater of ethics. Okay. When when you know you look at what happened with Google, several people got fired because they dared to say things that didn't quite match the party line. Okay. So when when Google will start seriously thinking about ethics, and Microsoft is now, I have to say, Microsoft is now trying to, to do what they call responsible technology development. They try to have, okay, there's a new technology. Let's, let's start to foresee possible consequences. And at the end of the day, it's going to be this flawed decision by humans. They're not perfect. You know, unlike, unlike Moses, my, counter, my, my namesake Moses, Moshe, Moses, Moshe is Moses. Moses had God telling him what to do, okay? I don't have God telling me, whispering in my ear what to do. And if I tell you that I have, then I should be I should be sent to some place to be checked out. And uh, human decision making is hard. And policy, you know, I said, you know, people would computer scientists would like a manual. Do this, do this, do this. Punch here, if then else. What will do? It's not going to be like that. But you know, I started program. I started going computer science because I enjoyed programming very much. But it was like a game. You know, it was okay. Can you do it with? And log n operation instead of n operation. It was a nice kind of puzzle, doing puzzles. But now, now a colleague of mine said, computer science, computing, is operating operating system of humanity. Larry Lessig, a well-known a, a legal scholar, wrote some years ago an important article: code is law. Once you you write it in code, 
That's the way the world will behave. That's become the law of the world. So we have to start taking this consideration early in the development, okay? We know, for example, take it the same thing, take it with computer security. If we build a system and then we say, oh, how can we make it secure? It's too late. You have to start from day one, do no harm. We're going to build a secure system. What should be the consideration? The internet, we said, let's build the internet. Security will be session level property. Look at the internet. And so obvious to us the security, we need to start thinking from the beginning about security. So I would say societal consequence, something we need to think from the very beginning, partly because of the scale. You're, you're building technology now that billions of people may use. The consequences are profound. Let's start thinking from the beginning. What are the consequences? Are we going to agree? No. Will there be debate? Yes. Will there be politics? Yes. Um, will we have to take a, consider different standards around the world? Yes. But it, but but the difficulty is not a license not to do it. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much for that talk. So, um, as, as I understand it, kind of the solution to the problem you're posing is you know, getting computer scientists and computer science students to develop a kind of ethic of responsibility, to see themselves as responsible for their decisions. Now, so I'm personally very much in favor of this. You know, I'm a, an ethicist working in a computer science department with, you know, with this embedded ethics program. I work with Sheila and, and other members of the computer science program to actually insert ethics modules into our computer science classes here. But I want to know what you make of two other kind of ways of think of two other models for um, introducing ethics into, into you know, the, the, the profession of computer science. So one might be along the lines of engineering, where you think of, um, you know, en en engineers are, uh, are, are professionalized regulated disciplines. So they have, you know, exams, they have code that they have to follow, they have those rings that they put on their fingers. Um, and so, you know, th th that offers maybe a different way of, off of kind of lacing ethical decision making into the, into the profession. Um, the other one is is um, how they do ethics in um, in medicine and in bioethics. So on top of that professionalization in you know in the biomedical context, um, they actually have trained ethicists running around, and those ethicists are you know typically integrated in decision making at every level. So much so that you know if there's any question about informed consent or you know allocation of resources you know uh, someone who has professional training in ethics is actually consulted and an essential part of the decision making process so i'm wondering you know while i'm kind of in personally in favor of you know I, I think this ethic of responsibility that you that you're talking about is 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 great and maybe even sufficient i wonder what you make of these kind of two alternative um modes of, of introducing ethics into computer science so I think the professional ethics that I think the places that most people really, the, the, where ethics really means, for engineers, I've yet to hear about engineers that got lost his job, got his, lost his license for ethical violation. I haven't heard. Doctors lose their license. Lawyers get, get disbarred, okay? I haven't heard an engineer get de-engineered, okay, because of this. And partly because it's kind of the, I'll tell you what the big difference today. Lawyers and attorneys and, and doctors are usually solo practitioners. Even if they work in a, in a big firm, in a hospital, they practice it individually. And they run into, into ethical questions. My client told me that and that, what can I do with that? Okay, so they go to someone who is maybe specialized in ethics, ask questions. Doctor face this question individually. Computer scientists do not face this individually. You work it, you work it. Maybe the, maybe Mark Zuckerberg need to have a, a, next to him, an ethics advisor, okay? But for most people, you're part of a team. You're working on the, on the hash function of the, of the distributed system, the cloud, it's, you know, you're working on a small part of, of a bigger thing, okay? So you don't have, you know, I can say that your own personal consequence is, uh, is there that you do something ethically or not. Is, is this hash function ethical or not? It's not going to be meaningful. It's a different model. In fact, you find out, so, com, so com, com, uh, uh, com, computer scientists, soft, software development usually don't necessarily require to be licensed. But electrical engineers often, often are required to be licensed. But if you go to a place 
like you find someone that uh, sign a design, like Intel design a microprocessor. Someone is, is licensed and that person will sign off on the design. But again, it's a huge project, many, many people. So this, this modes are different. And I would say the mass, the big team mode versus the solo practitioner modes are very, very different. And I don't think we can borrow from the solo practitioners mode to the, to the big team modes, okay? You know, who can influence what Facebook does? I would say is mostly Mark Zuckerberg, okay? And uh, if we can influence Mark Zuckerberg to think more ethically, I think it would be great. It would be good for Mark Zuckerberg to hire an ethicist. In fact, the higher he has an ethics board, it's questionable how, whether again, whether this is ethics, ethics of, of theater or really, or is it serious? Because to me, if I was in, I was an ethic board, I would say, sorry, you have to shut down the company. And of course, I will be out of the ethics board immediately. So, so the, the, real, the real kind of lesson to, uh, let's say, computer science students is not how do I make ethical decision there, but as a developer, but should I work for Facebook? That's the kind of, of decision making. Do I want to work for Facebook? If I think that, that the whole, the whole, I don't like the business model of the company, then I'll find another company that does, you know, medical instrumentation. I feel much better. I'm saving lives. Okay. There are places to work. Again, remember, computer scientists today are they're very fortunate. They are in high demand. They can find ethical jobs. And maybe that's the only way they will put some pressure on, on, on the industry. If people would view that as, this is not a place I'd like to work. Think what happened to the to the nuclear nuclear industry. People today think of nuclear as dirty. You know, it's a debate. When, you know, if we if we worry about 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 uh, about climate change, maybe we should have gotten more nuclear. But it has a radioactive image, so to speak. And so there are fewer and fewer nuclear engineering departments. Students go go on go to study nuclear engineering. In fact, it's part of the problem that nuclear engineering technology is not developed make, to make it safer and cheaper and everything because people don't want to deal with it. But I think the, the, the key answer to your question is that there are two very different models of professional responsibility and we have to distinguish between them. Thank you. So oh, Elliot, you're up next, but I'm going to interject because we're just um, coming up to 4.30 and I wanted to, to draw the, uh, the, the, the talk to an official close and, and then invite people to stay on. So for those of you who um, have to leave, maybe we can pause for a moment and just thank Moshe for a very interesting talk and discussion. Thank you, thank Moshe. You. And, and I will announce that we have a number of uh, interesting upcoming talks. Barbara Gross uh, will be speaking in a couple of weeks on fostering responsible computing research. It's the result of a study that's gone on recently, a multidisciplinary study of uh, responsible computing research, which she'll be discussing with us. And later in October, Jillian Hadfield, who's the director and chair of the Schwartz Riesman Institute and a professor of law at the University of Toronto, will have an in-person event where she'll be discussing some uh, work that she's done on a, um, giving a talk entitled Judging Fact, Judging Norms, Training Machine Learning Models to Judge Humans Requires a New Approach to data, Labeling Data. So stay tuned for more information on that. And, and now I'd, what I'd like to do is, is uh, encourage anyone who has to leave to leave quietly, but then um, cede the floor to Elliot who had the next question. Elliot? Hi, Moshe, thanks for the engaging talk. And the question I wanted to ask actually ended up being very closely related to the previous question. So if you feel like you've addressed my question already, then we don't have to discuss further. But I was also interested in specifically the role of non-computer science and non-technical scholarship in developing computer science pedagogy. I guess my concern would be that, because you said in your talk, like, Hindsight is 2020. Now we realize we're the empire, not the resistance. But if you go back to the 80s, 90s, 2000s, there were always people critiquing the role of technological development, artificial intelligence. And typically, those people, if they have a technical training like Philip Auger or Donna Haraway, they just get forced out of technical departments. They need to find a, a different place for them to, to voice their critiques. Computer scientists don't want to listen. So I would be concerned that as computer scientists, we don't have the right training 
to instill ethics in our pedagogy. And I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts about whether we can incorporate tools and critiques from other disciplines. Thanks. Do you know what was one of the early voices which is critiquing, critiquing technology, amazingly, was the Unabomber. If you, if you go back and you read the Unabomber Manifesto, he wasn't that, he was, it wasn't that crazy. He became crazy, but his, his solution was to go and try to kill people. Okay, that was a crazy solution. But if you read the manifesto, he was worried about the consequence of technology. And uh, this is something, discussing cons of technology, first of all, is something as, as technologies, we have an aversion to do it. We all uh, like to think, we all like to, well, I look at the mirror at least once a day when I shave in the morning, and we all like to feel good about what we are doing. So we've convinced ourselves that technology is good and more technology is, is even better and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there is, it's a good question and I think we need to explain with different models. So for example, Barbara Gross likes the embedded ethics model. Talk about ethics in, in every course. I'm still trying to figure out how to, how to put ethics in the automata theory course. Okay, I'm still working on that one. Other course is going to be easy, security and privacy, you know, it's going to be easy in other courses. But uh, the model, in fact, we wrote a proposal here at Rice a couple of years ago, which you don't get funded, was to try to do both. The advantage, for example, of a, of a semester long course is the depth you can get into issues. And it shouldn't spend a, a semester thinking about it every week, twice a week, every week, come up with very, they're very sensitized to this issue. And I'm hoping, you know, really we should have done is, you know, go back to the students five years later, 10 years later and find out how has it affected their thinking as technologies. But this is difficult to do, but I'll give you one quote by judging by their, the, the fun that we don't have an exam in this course. We don't want to give them an exam. They have to write an essay. And the essay is, what is my social responsibility as a computing professional? And reading these essays is very heartwarming. So, at least they grasp that their action have consequences. Now, what we have not done yet is develop the practice in industry of thinking about consequences. Somebody has a great idea and either, either the, the, the company will think this is a great idea, we're going to make lots of money, or the venture capitalist will think this is a great idea, we'll make lots of money. I said, Microsoft is one of the company now that start, said, let's think about consequences early on. We don't have this culture. We may not have all the tools. We'll have to experiment. And I said, who are, the prof who are the people that need to be in this conversation? Are we good at figuring out societal consequences? I don't think I'm particularly qualified to do that. I think there is a, there is, there is a learning curve, steep learning curve ahead of us. How to try to think more about the, the consequence of our action, the ACM code of ethics that we must reflect on the concept of our actions. But I, I think this is just the, the statement is the beginning. We have a responsibility to think about consequences. How to do this? We're going to learn how to do this. We've not done a good job. We must acknowledge we've not done a good job. And we need to start brainstorming and, and try different things to see. As I, I thought up an idea, science fiction writers, okay? I don't know what is the job market for science fiction writers. But maybe we take some people like that, and it could be that literally literary people would be a better job in imagining consequences of technologies and computer scientists do it. I mean, the kind of people look, we attract a particular type of people to study computing. Okay. Um, I know what attracted me to computing. Okay. It was, I didn't think it all about humanity and society, anything like that. It was like, hey, you can be solving puzzle all day and they'll pay you for it. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay. Now we know that it's not a game. Let's now think a bit more deeply about it. Great, thank you for the talk. So Mo Moshe, I'll enter, Brian is next, in, but I'm going to interject just as for the benefit of, of our, our colleagues in, at the University of Toronto who are still here. We run an embedded ethics program. We've been running it for, for we're in our third year. Steve, who asked the question previously, is our, our resident uh, ethics philosophy 
um, PhD who's who's assisting with this. And but our philosophy is a little bit different from from the one at Harvard that Barbara Gross, of course, initiated, which is to quote my colleague Diane Horton, who was here. Um, too much broccoli or Brussels sprouts is not necessarily a good thing. So we just sprinkle a little bit um, in certain courses, not in the automata theory course necessarily, because because you know it's the the ethical dilemmas are meant to be situated and discovered in the context of the learning and and not and it doesn't appear everywhere. But we're really uh, trying to find those courses where there it where these questions do arise and where there are issues to contemplate. And we're doing a longitudinal study to try to understand just how much is enough and what the impact of that is. And and so far we, we've got some interesting study uh, interesting results under review this year that show that you just sort of like COVID you need a little bit of a booster shot every so often, but that too much is is of no is of no added value. Um, so, anyways. Uh, more on that another time, but but I'll cede the floor to Brian. Brian. Well, thank you, Moshe. I think the last conversation we had was probably in 1983 at Stanford. So um, um, it's good to see you after less time. Um, I want to ask you a question about something I worry about, and therefore I'll probably be a bit inarticulate in saying it, but um, it has to do with this. My sense talking about these issues with students and so on and so forth, these others, is that, for example, as Marsha Chetchik said, we're not all that good at thinking about what the consequences are going to be. And, you know, historically, that's one of the reasons you think about human value, be, you know, values, because in fact, values are going to guide you and so on. Now, the difficulty one runs into with when the conversation turns to, to dealing with values, it seems to me, was the one brought up by Muhammad, who asked a question earlier on. There is this idea that and it's certainly true, ethical systems differ by different cultures around the world and so on and so forth. So, so I, I tend to feel as I say, look, we need to talk about human values. I get an onslaught of, look, they're all different and so on and so forth. And if you think that we can have a conversation about values, that's going to be colonialist or, you know, and I'm on the wrong side of every single complete, every single cultural <laughs> divide there is. Um, but here's the thing. I don't know of any ethical system in the world that says monetizing all the information in the world through hat advertising is going to promote the, 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 a more perfect union or any ethical system in the world at all that says, look, here's what we want to do. We want to actually give 90% of the wealth to the top 1% people and disadvantage, you know, virtually everybody who's disadvantaged and so on and so forth. And I think there's a bit of a fetishization at the moment of the differences in the ethical systems meaning that we somehow can't talk about values in a way that's productive. Computer science actually has technical expertise dealing with extremely complex forms of contextualization and so on and so forth, and not think that just reduces it all to, to nothingness and stuff. So do you think, do you think there's any chance that we can foster a discussion, not only about consequences, but about values, which pulls towards more a more perfect union with respect to the discussion of the values we hold dear and hold sacred and want to nourish in our conversation and not let the just as the politics have become polarized not sort of inadvertently cater to an idea that our ethical standards are so polarized that we can't actually have any have any union in there uh, that's really something I would like to see. And I, and I wonder what you think the prospects are. So I think it's possible. It takes some, for example, there are people who are, who are good at moderating such conversations. If you just throw people with very different opinions, you throw them, it just become like a food fight and they're not making good progress. So there are people who are good at moderating this. It turns out that uh, people say that, uh, you know, there sometimes are more agreement than we think. Okay, so, you know, for example, when you look at the uh, uh, United States, we keep thinking about free market with, you know, capitalism versus socialism, okay? But of course, these are two extreme points, okay? So if you show people, you ask people, for example, and I've, they've done the following, ask people, uh, take maybe the, the, the five quintiles. And we know that our people who are more talented, our people who are less talented, for whatever reason, what would be a reasonable, let's say, income distribution among the, 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 the five quintiles? 
And you can come up with something you average over many people and need some kind of consensus, okay? This would be, okay, it reflects some natural talent, you show wealth distribution. Then you ask them to tell you what do they think is the actual wealth distribution in the United States. Again, it's very difficult to do across the whole world. So it's okay to try, you know, to optimize it to a particular society, okay? Some technology is global, we have to worry about how to deal with global effect, but but I focus on, on what's happening to one country. So you show people, you ask people, what, is the, what do you think is the real distribution? And to show you something which is more skewed than their ideal distribution. But it is much less skewed than the real distribution. What the, their perception of the distributions, okay? Is much less skewed than the actual distribution. So if you go and you have gradually, you, you say, let's start what you think, what you think is an is a ideal one, what do you think is the real one? And then you show them the real one. Then people say, oh, that, that really doesn't sound good, okay? And, and that's otherwise, you know, any other discussion immediately gets into a food fight between the socialists and the, and, and the capitalists, okay? And even the socialists and capitalists, you know, they're just too, what is socialism? I mean, it's Denmark socialist country. Actually, it's a free market country, but they have, they have certain things that they do. You know, we can start talking about what makes sense? Actually, in this country, okay, we forget the the, the biggest benefactors of, of government subsidies are first corporations by myriad different subsidies. And after that, it's red states. For example, we, we subsidize farmers greatly in the United States. Where are the farmers? In red states. So when we think of there was a so-called welfare queens, the corporations, and uh, in red states. That's not the image. So it's possible to have more nuanced conversation and to kind of try to talk. If you are too abstract, then it just become, okay, more perfect union, sure. Okay, but what does it mean? Okay. If you go down way to level, it's just difficult to see what are the principle. So somewhere in between, I think it's possible to have a more nuanced conversation and in fact, what is it called? I think some country, maybe Ireland used something called Citizens Council. I think it was Ireland. There was something called Citizen Councils where people had disagreements and they tried to, to create this council of citizens and moderate a discussion. It turned out that you can bring people to some kind of agreement. But it's, I'm telling you, I'm, well, I'm not saying this because it's easy, it is hard, okay? Remember, remember what Sartre, what Sartre said, hell is other people. No, it's hard. And I saw recently a cartoon of other people saying, hell is Sartre. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So, so we have a group of people who are at, in the Mars building and I see that, that that group has their hand up. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask them, whoever it is there who wanted to ask a question. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for a non-traditional, outstanding talk. Uh, I'll be quick. I see that I'm the last one to ask, so I'll, I'll, make, I'll try to make my breaks uh, uh, quickly. My name is Ori, and I come from philosophy, and I deal with technology ethics and public policy. And I disagree with you on many things, but I'd like to take this opportunity here and to ask you, challenge you, ask what you think about one particular thing that you expressed. So in one of your slides, you argue that uh, people should be responsible uh, rather than technologies, which I completely agree with you, but the brute reality is that autonomous technologies, which are highly complex, also some of them distributed and decentralized with multi-stakeholders, um, change everything we know about liability and responsibility. And just to ground that what's going on, a few weeks ago, um, Department of Treasury Office um, sanctioned an algorithm and the Netherlands arrested a, a computer programmer that coded in open source for that algorithm that was sanctioned. So what's your take on this trend that obviously doesn't sit with uh, your views and mine? How do you, what's next, do you think? So we are, look, the reality is we are building system that makes makes decisions and the people said oh they should be fair they should be transparent they should be equitable whatever have you and 
we should we need to ask another question about many of these things. Are these decisions that we want to delegate to machines? Just because we could doesn't mean we should. I'll give you an example. Many decisions in the in the judicial system, people are building all kinds of decision autom auto automated decision system in the justice system. And there is huge demand for this because the decisions that have to be made are usually very difficult decision. We're asking judges to make very, very difficult decision. So if you tell the judge, look, um, you know, you don't have to make a decision on sentencing, that the system, the system will make a decision on sentencing. Do we want the computer to decide to make decision that have profound implication for humans' life and welfare? That's a discussion we need to have. And we have, I'm not saying people say, oh, it has to be unbiased. Wait a minute, before it's gonna be unbiased, I want to know. Should machine make this kind of decisions? How about instead, let's think of what is the, you know, we have bias in the justice system. Let's use AI technology to discover bias of judges and alert them, alert their, their, the chief justice, what have you about these issues, okay? I mean, this philosophy that we have, technology, if, if technology can do it, we should let it do it, is some kind of technological determinism. And I think we have to, to assert, don't be driven by, remember what BMD, BMW says, don't be driven by technology, drive it. We have to decide how do we want, what, what role do we want technology to play in our lives, okay? I mean, technology showing me what is the best route to the, to the drugstore, sure, oh, it's okay, I'll, it's convenient, I'll go with that, okay? But as you, as you lift the level of what technology can do, I think we are, we are seeding autonomy to machines without thinking about consequences. And really this partly, if you go to look, watch Black Mirror very often, that's what about, what's a Black Mirror is about, okay? There was a technical capability, we created it because we could, oops, look what happens. It's, it's, that's, let's, let's have few oops moments. Fair enough, thank you. So we, it's 47 and we have, do have a little bit more time. Um, uh, I know Moshe has to leave right a few minutes before five o'clock, but, but uh, I want to invite- yeah, I, I, have about, I have about five more minutes. Okay, I had a question if no one else has a question, but I, but I can talk to you another time. So I'd, I'd prefer if somebody else has a question. Going, going, gone. Um, so, you know, there's this expression, you can't fight the system from outside the system. And, and I was struck by the fact that at the, at the very beginning of our talk, of your talk, you, um, when you gave, tri gave tribute to uh, Fahim, that you talked about posting it on Facebook and, and the outpouring of, of uh, um, you know, of, of warm reactions. And, and, um, and so one thing that I struggle with with respect to, to, to Facebook or any of these, these companies that have questionable uh, ethics is that if we all don't go and work there and none of these students that have consciences or or that are aware of these issues don't go and work for Facebook, then then who's going to change Facebook? Uh, either either people have to stop using it or it has to change from the inside. And 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 neither what you're advocating doesn't provide for either solution, it seems. So you know some organizations are open to change from inside. But in my opinion, when I look at Facebook and Google, they're not open to change from the inside. So Facebook, I mean, I mean all of these companies engage in, in, again, in ethics washing, but when, when, when voices coming out, critical voices come from inside, what happened with Google kind of about a year or plus ago, that was a whole bunch of firing of people because they didn't like it. And they all come accused that you should have get the paper approved, you should have done this, should have done that. But I have not seen that, uh, that Google and Facebook are companies are willing to, to be changed from, from inside. Now, I have to say, I'm kind of torn about Facebook because I, 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 I'm a compulsive sharer. You know, I I've, I've remember when I, you know, when I came to Rice and I would do everything by copying my, I was department chair, I copied my faculty all the time and people complain about, you're wasting too much paper. And then we started scanning, oh, we can send PDFs. And people say, well, you're, 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 you're wasting disk, disk storage by sending PDF to everyone. So I created my own, my own social media thing. I created on my Facebook, it was the miscellaneous page where I posted things that are of interest. So it, 
It's only stored one, stored one shall read many. So Facebook give, give me the ability to share and I give me the ability to learn what, what people are doing. And I think I discovered about Fahim's uh, death on Twitter. And I'm, you know, the technology does enable me to share it and people learn about it. And I think the people who learn about it, you know, they're all of course chagrined to hear the news, but they wanted to hear this news, okay? And so you could say, if you're so critical of Facebook, why don't you stop using Facebook? But, you know, imagine we have a scenario that uh, the phone company will listen to your phone calls. And if you use obscenities on the phone, they will disconnect you or suspend your, your, your phone account for a month. And people, and, and it's, an, it's covered in the term of service. So it's all you sign on it when you pick up the phone for the first time. And it says, well, you agreed to it. Of course, you can not use the phone. And answer, it's not realistic, right? This is now how we live our life. We live our life with the sharing. What we need to think is how to do it in a way that's less harmful to society. So let's have, you know, right now, the what kind of the content moderation uh, Facebook does is Facebook business model. That's it. It's, a, it's a, in fact, it's a closed trade secret. We don't know exactly what they do. Um, there have been proposals how to do that. Let's separate one proposal was let's separate the storage of information from the moderation. Open Facebook API and, and you decide to start a company doing other kind of moderation and I'll tell you a moderation algorithm rather than a Facebook moderation algorithm. So suddenly now, of course, this, this is not Facebook interest because they are trying to maximize user engagement. But maybe I will, uh, I will, uh, would like to sign up to your Facebook fa content moderation because it's more socially responsible. Okay, I'll do that. We don't have choices there. And so we have really, we have monopolies. We have effectively in digital technology is very open to monopolies because of so-called the network effect. Everybody's on Facebook. So you want to be on Facebook. Even Google couldn't compete with it. They started with, 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 uh, with uh, Google Plus and they had to get out. They couldn't compete with Facebook. To tell someone, well, it's your choice to be on Facebook. Yes, it's true, it's my choice. But if I do that, I'm cutting myself to a big part of today of societal conversation. And I don't see those companies open to change from the inside. So I think the thing that will force them will be either, which I don't see happening right now, people saying, I'm not going to work for this company, they're starting to lose, lose workforce because their most important asset is the people who work there. If that happens, if their image becomes so negative, or if there's some regulation that says, for example, open your API so, so we can, I can go and obtain different content moderation algorithms. There has to be the internal, the change from the, from the inside I don't see it right now. Yeah, I guess certainly for, I mean, certainly for big, big policy things, but there are a lot of small things, I think, the way that 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 um, software is developed, the decisions that are made about what data to use. I think often it's it's the case that, that managers don't, aren't aware of the decisions that, that people on the ground floor, you know, who are actually building the algorithms and, and using data are making. And I think that they're, I think even working for those companies, that there's a lot that can be done to change the culture from within. And, and uh, yeah. And I think I, 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 think I would be, NF, I would be NF, delighted. I would be delighted to see that from the inside people can change. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I can that's tell you my optimism. Yeah. But I, I'm trying to change university from the inside, and I find it very, very difficult. So changing a, a, a corporation from the inside, very difficult. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. I wish all the best to people who tried. Well, now we, um, need, now we need to wrap up now. Yes, exactly. On that note, let me thank you one more time for a very interesting and engaging discussion. And I and and thank you to everyone who stayed around um, for the excellent discussion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Be so be socially responsible. <laughs>